My guess would be that it was as a response to American models that Patrick White made his breakthrough in The Tree of Man and Voss. What he opened up there was the power of naming a previously unnamed world, a belief that Australian lives could be universally significant and constitute a larger-than-life drama in which the domestic and daily <coughs> could leap far out, but also deeply within, to take in both the epic business of making a nation and the more inward, dreamlike business that belongs to the interior world of individual sensibility and consciousness. It was an attempt to delineate and analyze what till then I'd say our writing had been too embarrassed in its close-lipped, ironic, extrovert, masculine way to do more than hint at the existence of a complex and contradictory, uniquely Australian soul. Essential to this was the invention of a language, at one level, dense, modernistic, poetic, sometimes grotesque and overwrought. At another level, rawly local and vernacular, which would reflect the light in which his sometimes tormented characters were to be caught, and the very idiosyncratic angle from which White viewed them. As some painters of the time, Drysdale and Nolan, for example, had created archetypal figures in a landscape that for all their expressionistic distortion or abstraction were also intended to be representative and real. It was a sense that Patrick White's work had a Tolstoyan grandeur that was not available to English writers that made London critics greet A Tree of Man and Voss with such acclaim. And it was a sense that White was writing a new continent that made the Swedish Academy award him the prize. I began as a writer of fiction in a post-White period when it was taken for granted that some version of the matter of Australia was the only serious subject for an Australian writer. It was essential to the dialogue between an Australian writer and his or her readers, that he should speak for the consciousness, the conscience of the world that made him. Most of my contemporaries and near contemporaries, I think, accepted this and it determined both what they wrote and the kind of writers they became. Thea Astley, David Ireland, Tom Keneally, Jessica Anderson, Randolph Stowe, Christopher Koch, David Foster, Peter Carey, Kate Grenville, Robert Drew, Rodney Hall, though the differences between those writers points back to what I referred to as some version of the matter of Australia. These versions, if we think of books like The Chant of Jim Jimmy Backsmith Smith, or Poor Fellow My Country, or Illy Wacker, or Just Relations, or The Secret River, could be very different from one another, both in approach and style. Among the poets, Les Murray belongs in there, though a whole swag of other poets in almost the same generation, John Tranter and John Forbes among them, resisted. And Tom Keneally, at some cost, I think, to his reputation, at least among academics, soon began to choose his subjects wherever his very lively interests took him. When I wrote An Imaginary Life, which is my second book, novel in 1975, I understood immediately that a work set in the distant past, outside Australia, and with on the surface nothing to do with the matter of Australia or with Australianness or Australian life, was unlikely to find a publisher or even perhaps readers here. I was lucky enough to have it taken in New York and later in London. It was a book, as overseas readers recognised quite clearly, almost from the beginning, that only an Australian might have written, and full of questions about the centre and the edge, the metropolitan and the barely marginal, about landscape, about language, 
that only an Australian might have seen in the material and taken up. All this quite apart from its interest in the nature and purpose of language itself and in wildness and spiritual regeneration. The more local, those more local questions uh, of geography and culture and the relation between the two mattered to me because I was an Australian and were also, and in fact, part of the matter of Australia, but in a different form. What I had no notion of at that time was that I had, like Ovid, wandered off the known literary map and produced an example of a new kind of writing, the post-colonial, a category at that time that I had quite simply never heard of. So what about now? Looking about at the arts in general, I'm struck by what seems to me to be a crisis both of energy and direction in our local culture that expresses itself in several forms. The confidence and expansiveness of a few years back in writing, theatre, films in particular, that took Australian work out into the world at large seems largely to have lapsed and the momentum stalled. There has been, in the past 10 or 15 years, a sense of exhaustion in the community, of withdrawal and stagnation <coughs> that is sometimes attributed to the political style of the Howard years. I'm in, more inclined, I must say, to see the Howard years themselves as another product of it rather than a cause. And what we've seen so far of the Rudd years shows, seems to me a rather dour and grim continuation. What are some of the signs of such a crisis? One I'd suggest is that Australian readers and Australian audiences for film, theatre, concert music seem no longer to be engaged as they once were by Australian work just because it is Australian. They no longer turn to Australian novels or films to find a reflection of themselves even in comic distortion or to see who, as Australians, we are and how we've got to be what we are. They seem less concerned with the question taken up so enthusiastically in the Keating years, was it, and made so much of in the media of Australian identity. Arts organisations in their mission statements still go on telling us that what we need to do is make work, plays, operas and the rest, that tell our own stories. But what audiences and readers increasingly tell us is that they don't really want to hear them. The books readers buy these days come straight off the bestseller list in London and New York. So the D do the DVDs and films. This lack of confidence in readers and filmgoers feeds back immediately to publishers, and fi financial backers. Of course, this lapse of energy of confidence may no be no more than one arc of a cycle, a natural relaxation and regathering, rather an extended one in this case, after a period of excited expansion and a burst of high-level production in almost every field. Or it may be a generational shift. We hear a good deal these days about Gen X's difficulty in following on from the baby boomers. Or it may be the effect of a long period of affluence in which the public has been largely taken up with shopping, home improvement, new technologies like the internet, uh, video games and iPods, and the almost <coughs> continuous spectacle in the media of commercialised sport. As for the move away from an interest in what is specifically Australian, other forces might offer themselves as explanations of that. The globalisation of culture, especially popular culture, and all its institutions, publishing, distribution, marketing, and the cult of international celebrity. The triumph of the belief that entertainment, infotainment, is all we need to fill our time and feed our spirit. An argument strongly promulgated by cultural gurus and institutionalised now in the education system 
that the truest expression of place and time and of the issues that concern us is popular culture and that what is referred to often dismissively as high culture is to be distrusted as elitist, that is, socially divisive, and from an ideological point of view, dubious, a repository of insidious racist, imperialist, sexist, and class attitudes that is dangerous, especially to young minds. Well, perhaps what we are seeing is a return in a new form of what we used to call the cultural cringe, a humiliating sense that what comes from elsewhere is cooler, sexier, more glamorous, more contemporary and relevant, or bolder and more transgressive, or simply more easily recognized and safer because its appeal is guaranteed by previous international acclaim than the organically homegrown. Or, and here I take a leap into more hopeful territory, is what we are seeing the first signs of something entirely new. A step forward, rather cautious as yet, from new nation nationalism to a situation where Australian readers, film goers and, Austra and audiences of all kind can take their Australianness for granted. And Australian writers, for example, on the grounds that what I've called the matter of Australia has now done its job, has exhausted its freshness and whatever pressure there might have been to do it, are Australian writers now free to relinquish the attempt to be representative and write merely as themselves, choosing whatever subjects catch their interest and catching readers wherever they can, here or anywhere else they might get published. This really might represent a change. And the latest works of some of our most talented writers, I notice Luke Davies, Delia Faulkner, Julia Lee, have bold non-Australian subjects in, in their new works. Uh, Davies and Faulkner work very confidently with iconic American material. And I begin to detect a certain strain at times in some of our older writers to introduce rather late in the piece an Australian dimension to works whose real energy and life, I suspect, lies elsewhere. Our younger visual artists feel no such constraint. The ambitions of the smartest of them, photographers, video artists, into installation and conceptual artists, is not to discover a new version of the Australian landscape or any other local phenomenon, but to make it big on the international art scene at Venice or Baal or Kassel or in one of the commercial galleries in New York. After all, apart from the brief London success of Sid Nolan in the 60s, what did exploring the, the local landscape do internationally for Drysdale or Fairweather or Fred Williams or more recently for William Robinson? In other areas, opera for instance, the question is now an open one of what it is that makes a work authentically Australian or even if this is a useful category and how relevant locality might be to an Australian audience that is as likely to connect directly with an opera by Andre Previn or John Adams or Philip Glass as with the work of a local composer. Australian filmmakers, of course, have long ceased to limit themselves to Australian subjects, though they remain confident in what we might recognise as their Australian style. This is because film has always been seen as a purely commercial medium and because our best directors more often work outside the country than at home. I offer this suggestion of a change in our attitude to the national culture, if that is what it is, only tentatively, as I said at the start. It may in fact be no more than a temporary retreat and such a change, if it is that, might and might not be fruitful. <coughs> if it frees artists up to be more deeply themselves, and this expands and deepens their work, good. If it simply enslaves them to productivity and the demands of the international market, not so good. Though this would do what all extreme pressure does, and has always done, sort the serious 
from the unserious, the stayers from the stumblers at the second or third hurdle. Whether it would be more enriching for readers, theatres and opera goers, concert goers, followers of the visual arts is another question altogether. So much of what matters in all the arts, or has mattered in the past, has been locally grounded and recognised and rich, as rich and powerful at home somewhere before it has been translated abroad. Perhaps in speaking globally, we mean a world where it is, is, there is no longer a distinction between home and abroad. But people's daily lives are lived in strict limits of time, place, customs, light, weather. And most stories, even ones we recognise as archetypal when we first hear them, have a local habitation, as our dreams do. I should add just two things. This crisis, as it affects artists in culture as a national venture, may not be limited to Australia. We ought to be wary, except in the realm of fiction, of claiming to have penetrated the motives and reasons of others. So I say this with all due caution. But I wonder to take a case that is close to us, if John Kurtzia's decision to leave South Africa after he wrote Disgrace and make a new life here wasn't a move to relieve himself as a writer of the need to speak always as the conscience of the country either because he felt he had got to the end of South Africa as a subject, or because it had ceased as a subject to be personal and necessary to him in a way that allowed him to write about it, or because he felt his being so often seen in these limiting terms was a limitation of his freedom to write what he wants. South Africa had always been only part of his work, though a large one. There was also what drew him to books such as Foe, and the master of St. Petersburg. That feeling for what his writing is, for the dimensions of his body of work and how it might go on, is entirely personal to any writer. And for writers, the individual and personal it is what it always comes down to. And that is the second thing I want to assert here at the end. Writers may find themselves writing within a culture, even a national culture, but their duty, finally, is to their own writing life and to the body of their work. That is, to themselves. And this is true, of course, of any serious artist in any field. Thank you. Thank you.